Hey guys, and welcome to episode number three of The Car Flip Show. And I'm just thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna do when I run out of fingers, well, after I get to five. I don't know if I'll do, I don't know. We'll find out. Um, so this is episode number three of The Car Flip Show. We've got three questions today. Um, and those questions are, uh, one is from Dustin95Neon on YouTube. And Dustin, if you own a Neon, I'm sorry, they weren't the best built cars. So you're probably really good at working on things if you own a Neon. No offense to Neon owners, they just weren't the best cars. Um, and if you see me moving my mouth around, I have a cough drop. I've had this annoying cough, and it's not even a good cough. It's not like a cough where you, uh, you know, it's a manly cough, it's just a little <laughs> And so I'm trying to avoid that with the cough drop. So if you see me acting funny with my mouth, that's what it is. Um, but Dustin asks, do you ever put aftermarket parts on a car to give them more, to give them a more appealing look? Uh, nothing crazy, um, but to make nothing crazy to make it full custom, but like basics, like rims, tent, windows, stuff like that. We'll check that question out here in a minute. The other one was from, I'm assuming this is not his real name. If so, this is the coolest name I've ever heard. Um, this is from Ice North on YouTube. It says, I'm wondering how you got your technical knowledge on cars. It seems key to avoiding buying ones that are more work than they're worth. So we'll look at Ice North's awesome name. Question. And the second one was from Amanda. This was an emailed question to me. Um, it was, what do you say when contacting a seller? Um, and she was referring to, what are the words, like what are the exact words you're saying? When you call somebody, um, you say hello, what do you say next? Uh, so we'll look at that. And then I had another random question, and it was in regards to the pineapple. Where's it at? They were wondering what's up with the pineapple. So we'll get to that at the end. Uh, before we start, I wanted to um, kind of give you a quick lesson, I guess you could call it. Um, I do a lot of coaching, or I've done a lot of coaching. I'm phasing that out. I'm working towards creating a course where people can have the content in front of them and you know, kind of go about it at their own pace as opposed to having weekly calls uh, via Skype. But one of the things that I hit first, and the most important thing in flipping, period, is the buy, is the buy. And see my voice is cracking. This is embarrassing, but it's okay. Um, but the buy is the most important part of any car flip. A lot of people say they wanna make money selling cars, which sounds great, um, and a lot of people do. People get jobs at car dealerships, um, they sell cars for a living, but the money is made at the buy. I mean, think about it. You probably, at some point in your life, have sold a car. Um, you have friends that have sold cars. Your, your grandmother has probably sold a car. Um, but have they made money on them? Some people get lucky and they get close to what they paid for them or they, maybe they buy a really desirable car like a Honda, a Toyota, maybe a Jeep Wrangler and the value in the market is so strong that they don't lose that much money. For most people, that's a win. They sell the car, they get close to what they paid for it, they don't lose that much money, they're happy. With car flipping, the goal is obviously to make money. And so anybody can sell a car, but not everybody can buy a car correctly. And just in the most simplest of terms, the profit is made when you buy a car. I'm gonna stick my phone in my pocket here for a minute. The profit is made when you buy a vehicle. Let's say this is market value. Anywhere you buy below here is profit. So you buy a car $100 below market value. Hopefully you can get what the market value is so you make 100 bucks. You buy a vehicle 500, 1,000, 1,500 dollars, I'm running out of camera space here. But if you buy that much below the market, there's your profit. It just as a general rule, if you want to do a quick search just to see what I'm talking about, if you go on kbb.com, there's a lot of different sites that give you values for cars. You've got Kelly Blue Book, which is kbb.com. You've got NADA, which is I believe nadaguides.com. Um, both are good resources. They're not the Bible, as in if you look up a value of the car of, or of a car, that doesn't mean the car is worth that amount and no more or no less. Sometimes it's wrong. I do a lot of Jeep Wranglers. It's always wrong on a Jeep Wrangler because the market value is higher than what the book value is. I prefer kbb.com, Kelly Blue Book. They seem to be a little more reasonable as far as what I'm seeing in the market. So if you take, for example, let's say a 2000 for Honda Accord. You put in the miles, the different um, options that it has, it's gonna give you a value and you're gonna have three options on the value. There's gonna be trade-in value, there's gonna be private party, and there's gonna be, I believe it's called retail, or I believe it's retail value. The value you're most concerned with is private party because that is potentially 
what you can sell it for. That's your, um, your baseline. So the private party is what you expect to sell it for. The trading value, which should be much lower, is supposed to be what a dealer would generally pay for it at auction or what a dealer would give you for it on trade. Trading value and wholesale value, which is what is paid at auction, are usually similar. So that's your, kind of your target. So you can look at private party, you can look at trading value, you can see what the amount of profit is. So I'm just guessing I'm gonna make up numbers, I'm probably wrong. Let's see, but let's say private party would be for uh, 04 Honda Accord, let's say it has 130,000 miles. Let's say private party is $6,000 and then trading value comes in at 4200 There's $1,800 there that could be made if you can buy the car at trading value. Now just because trading value is um, 40, let's say it's $4,200, that doesn't mean that someone's gonna sell their car for $4,200. But it gives you an idea how maybe a car dealer will look at values, which is how you need to look at values because it doesn't matter what the KBB is, that's, or the KBB private party, that's not what you should pay. You should pay closer to the trading value. And you should always reference that number just because KBB says it or NADA says it like we mentioned earlier, that doesn't mean it's worth that amount. You should reference that number with the market and the market is found on sites like Craigslist or AutoTrader or Cars.com. I prefer Craigslist because it's more private party focused which means you're gonna have more reasonable prices which are what you're gonna be selling for. So let's say you put that 2004 Honda Accord in the search bar on Craigslist. You want to search by owner because dealers sometimes will sell at that other amount that Kelly Blue Book has which is retail and you can't generally sell at retail. So you're going to put in 2004 Honda Accord in the search bar on Craigslist and then you're going to put by owner. You only want to search by owner and you can see what other people are asking for similar Craigslist and you'll see different prices come in on the page which will be for various reasons. Some will have less miles, some will be in better condition, some will have a salvage title which means they'll be cheaper. Um, some will have um, modifications maybe. So you see prices kind of scattered about, but you should, you should see a baseline start to form. So as you see prices going up and down, there should be a baseline somewhere that should fall within somewhere probably close to the Kelly Blue Book. It doesn't have to, but whatever that baseline is, that's more important to us than what the Kelly Blue Book is because that's what people are actually asking for those vehicles. So if Kelly Blue Book says that vehicle is worth $6,000 and you pay $4,200 and then you find out the baseline on Craigslist is 45, if you list it for six and everyone else is asking 45, you're not gonna sell that car, it's just not gonna happen. So reference Kelly Blue Book, that's important, but the more important thing is the baseline price on Craigslist. And obviously take into account miles, condition, miles even more so. Um, but use that as you buy, find that baseline, and then find that price that you can buy it for. Um, and that will make all the difference because when you buy, that's when the money's made. So that's our quick lesson for today. Um, a little different format than the other two shows we've done. They've been strictly questions, but I've had people um, that have asked that question over and over again. What's the most important thing um, that I need to know about car flipping? And it's about buying. You have to buy right. If you buy right, you can make money. If you buy wrong, it's not gonna be any fun. You're gonna lose money and you're gonna get tired of it. Um, focus on the buy and you will be glad you did. So I'm gonna get my phone out and we're getting to the questions. Uh, let's see, our first question, which we read a while ago was, um, do you ever use aftermarket parts to give them, to give them an appealing look? Uh, he was basically asking, um, is it worth it sometimes to spend money to make the car look nicer? If I get a car and it doesn't have hubcaps, I'm gonna buy hubcaps and I'm gonna put them up there. If I, if I get a car that the radio doesn't work, generally I'm gonna try to find the factory radio if possible. Now if that factory radio is more expensive than an aftermarket radio, I'm gonna go aftermarket. You can buy a good used aftermarket radio on eBay for 50 bucks. You can get on, you can go to Walmart and buy them for 89, 100 bucks. They even have cheaper ones if I remember right. Um, so things like that, definitely. Hubcaps for sure. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna turn the camera actually and show you if you can see it there. That is a, 1997 Jeep Wrangler and as you can see um, the bumper here that is not a factory bumper um, a Jeep Wrangler does not sit this high I'm gonna lean the camera forward we've got really massive oversized tires those are 37 inch tires 
Um, it's got a lot, it's got body armor, it's got special fenders, um, it's got all kinds of aftermarket stuff on it, but I'm gonna turn the camera back. That's because it's a Jeep Wrangler and people like those kind of things on a Jeep Wrangler. A lift, big tires, um, special modifications to the bumper, those kind of things. Those appeal to people that drive Jeep Wranglers. Now, not everybody, let's go back to the Honda Accord, not everybody that is looking for Honda Accords is going to appreciate special low profile tires. Um, they're not going to appreciate maybe the racing springs or the lowered suspension or the um, maybe the special interior colors that you, some people like the paint interior pieces, um, red and yellow and blue, whatever. Most people aren't going to be into that. So you're wasting your time and you're kind of cutting down the market that's going to be interested on that vehicle. So for me, from a cosmetic standpoint, to put it back to as close as factory as possible, <coughs> there's the cough. If I'm not doing a Jeep Wrangler, um, for me, I'll do it all day long to make it nice, um, basically to uh, maybe cover up and fix small issues. I'm going to buy the factory match uh, touch-up paint. I'm going to put the hubcaps up there. If I have a mismatched wheel, I'm going to buy the right wheel. If I have bad tires, you obviously do tires. Um, from an aftermarket, as far as souping it up, usually no, unless it's something special like a Jeep Wrangler or a pickup truck. If you put a lift in tires, that's a nice add. But don't make it too um, don't make it too specialized that you cut down the market that would be interested. Because most of the time, when you customize something, you do increase the value, but you also decrease the people that are interested in it. Unless it's something like a Jeep Wrangler, I keep going back to that. People love people love lifted Jeep Wranglers when you. Lift a Wrangler, you increase the amount of people that are interested, as opposed to a Honda when you lower it and make it like a race car, then you decrease the amount of people interested. And the funny thing about that is when you spend the money to do all of that, the people that are interested are the people that don't have money because young kids, um, generally, you know, teenagers, they like the lower cars, but unfortunately, they don't have any money. And so they ask their parents to buy that car and their parents say, no way, it looks like this. So you kind of cut down your market. So be careful with that. Um, we're gonna go to question number two, which is, I'm wondering how you got your technical knowledge on cars. Everything I know about cars, if I am honest, stems back to, I'd have to give my dad a ton of credit here. Um, the first, one of the first major things I learned about cars actually came from my father-in-law. He taught me how to do brakes. Um, but growing up, my dad was always flipping cars in the driveway. Um, he basically did what I did growing up. There was always a different car. It was usually something you know, interesting. Maybe it was a Corvette or a Porsche or a, I'm trying to think of some things he had. He did boats for a while. Um, he had motorcycles here and there. We had all kinds of things in the driveway. And he would be out there working on them. And as a kid, honestly, I wasn't as interested until I figured out that there was money to be made. So it's not like I was out there turning wrenches as a kid. Um, when I got into high school, I started thinking about how I needed to make money because that became important because I knew college was coming. I wanted to buy myself a car. And what ended up happening was, I started buying cars and then when I had issues, I could ask my dad to come and basically say, this is what you need. Or I would have an idea of what it is and he would come by and say, no, it's not bad, it's actually this. So I learned by him basically walking me through things. And eventually, after I graduated college, we started a car dealership, which actually turned into a service center as well. And I ran the day-to-day -day operations of the car dealership and the service center. So if you called, um, and it's actually called, it was called CarPro, if you called CarPro, I was the one that answered. If you came in to look at a car, I was the one that showed you the car. If you needed a service job written up on your, um, let's go back to the Neon, because Neons, they always need work. Sorry, Dustin. Um, but if you came in with the Neon and you needed a catalytic converter, I was the one that priced the job for you. I was the one that went out and looked at the vehicle. And the funny thing was, when we first opened the business, I didn't honestly know 100% what I was looking at. But people assumed that I did because I was wearing the shirt with the um, name of the company there. So I'd go out, I'd look at it, I'd call my tech over and say, can you, you know, verify what I think I'm seeing? He would do so, and then I would write the job up. I would price the part, I'd price the labor. And in the beginning days, before we had uh, multiple mechanics, I was out there putting in alternators, putting in AC compressors. I remember one of the first big jobs we got was a, uh, a guy with a custom uh, Mustang. It was a like an 04 Roush. It was just had custom painted. It was ridiculous the amount of money the guy put in this thing. But he was wanting to change out change out his exhaust, and he came in and asked if we could do it. And we took any job we could get because we were just starting out. And so we said, sure, you know, of course, we, yeah, definitely we could do that. 
but we had no idea and my phone is going off and I'm gonna turn it on vibrate. Um, so we took the job, I get this box of parts, um, it's exhaust parts, it came from uh, somewhere like eBay or Amazon or something. And so I open it up and there's an instruction, like literally like one, do this, two, three, and it was like 47 different steps. So, and I literally went through, just by looking at this paper, did it step by step by step, and in between the guy was coming in and like wanted to look and see how I was doing, and I'd have to pretend like I knew what I was doing, and I was nervous and sweating, and uh, but basically I learned kind of the trial by fire method. I had to learn it, I had to do it, because uh, one, as I was flipping from 16 years old through, when we started the dealership, I would have been 20, I might be wrong on this, um, 22-ish, maybe, 21, 22. Um, so for the 16 to 22, say those um, six years, I was buying and selling on my own. I was fixing everything in the driveway, which gave me the knowledge to know and understand somewhat I was doing there at the dealership. Um, so I ran that business for five and a half years or so, uh, which eventually I quit to start my own business. Um, but that's my background, uh, doing it myself in the driveway, Googling, like literally my phone and Google um, was an awesome resource. Eventually we uh, got programs like All Data, which is something that big shops use to price jobs, but it also gives you a detailed breakdown uh, of what repairs entail. So eventually I had that resource, but Google um, will teach you a ton. You have a random noise or you have that Dodge Neon that needs an alternator. You Google how to replace an alternator on a 2001 Dodge Neon. Somebody's done it and posted the video about it and all you have to do is watch and basically copy what they did and go to advance and or I would actually probably recommend you to go to eBay and uh, and buy the part because you're gonna save some money. So that's my background. That's how I know what I'm doing um, by doing it, by learning on the fly. So and also by running the business that was very helpful um, and learning the process there. And finally our third question from Amanda which is what do you say when you contact a seller? Basically the things you say when you contact a seller are the things that are gonna save you time um, basically going from car to car. You don't want to waste your time going and look at, looking at 10 cars and just buying one. You want to go and look at a car and generally know what you're going to be seeing when you get there by the questions you ask on the phone call. Questions like, does it have any major mechanical problems? Um, is there anything that's not mentioned in the listing that I would notice when I got there? Um, is the interior clean? Does it have any check engine light? That's an important one. Does it have any check engine lights? If they say yes, if so, have you had the codes checks or checked? Do you know what those codes are? If they say yes, write those codes down and Google them. If we're going back to our 04 Honda Accord, you would Google 2004 Honda Accord and the code will be P0 something, P0420. That would be a catalytic converter code. Uh, P0455, that would be an EVAP code. Uh, P0302, that would be a misfire on cylinder two. And these are all things that you'll see reference. The only reason I know that off the top of my head is because I've literally looked at thousands of codes on cars um, diagnosing problems. But those are things you'll start to pick up when certain codes are said, you'll know the problem. But for now, we're gonna use our handy dandy cell phone or computer and Google and we're gonna figure out things that way. So we wanna save ourselves time from driving to figure out all of these problems later. We wanna know now before we go. Most people will be honest, I've not had a lot of people lie, like blatantly lie and try to cover up things. You will have that for time, from time to time. You have to keep your guard up. Um, sometimes it's easy for me when you have several deals or people are just honest time after time after time. Sometimes you begin to let your guard down and just one person tries to sneak something through. Um, that one thing that they sneak through could be something major like a transmission. It could be something major like a check, check engine light. It's gonna cost you $700 to repair. We don't want those things to sneak, to sneak up on us. And those are things that you can avoid by asking the right questions ahead of time. So last but not least, and I'm really surprised we got this question, but I've had more than one people actually ask, and I'm not sure why. Uh, they wanna know what's up with the pineapple. And honestly, the story behind that is my wife and I were at, I think it was Hobby Lobby a few years ago, and we're walking through, we're buying decorations for our house, and um, I can't say anything about my wife and Hobby Lobby. Like I wanna make fun of her for saying how crazy she is about the store. But seriously, I like it too because they have a lot of really cool like automotive stuff, like decorations. So we're there, we're going through, we're buying decorations for our house. We're doing like a major whatever at the time. And we came across the pineapple. And at the time, I was deep into the show Psych. I don't know if you've seen Psych. Um, 
you got Sean and Gus, um, the psychic detective. It probably sounds really stupid with me explaining it, but if you've seen the show, you know it's awesome. If you've not, you have a lot of really good stuff ahead of you if you watch the show. I think there's eight seasons. Uh, but in every single show on Psych, there's a pineapple, whether it's an actual pineapple sitting on a desk, whether someone's eating pineapple, um, there's always a pineapple in the episode. So I saw the pineapple, I wanted the pineapple, and as you can see, much to my wife's dismay, I got the pineapple. So that's the story on the pineapple, and that's probably why it's here at my office and not at home, because my wife, I, she wasn't the hugest fan probably of the pineapple. So that's the pineapple story. So. If you enjoy this show, I would love for you, if you're seeing this on YouTube, to subscribe to this channel. Um, there's going to be more shows like this coming. There's going to be more helpful tips. Um, I think our most viewed show so far, interestingly enough, is how to fix a cigarette burn um, using a razor blade and glue, which is interesting. That's the most viewed one, but hey, whatever. Um, but if you're interested in things like that, quick repairs, um, tips and tricks on car flipping, maybe some automotive repair. Um, if you would be interested in adding a few thousand dollars a month to your income um, outside of getting another job, car flipping could be the thing for you. And I'm going to be talking more about that on this site. Now, the really, or the more interesting thing, even more interesting than the site, now still subscribe, but what you need to do is be a part of our Facebook group. That's where all the awesome stuff happens. And I'm about to choke on my, there we go, my cough drop almost went down my throat. That would have been fun. Um, the Facebook group, which is The Car Flip, I believe that's it, The Car Flip. Um, if you go to thecarflip.com, there's a bar, a little banner up at the top that, I forget what it says, but there's a place for your email address. Um, if you enter your email address, you will get notifications of content like this, or if there's a new blog that goes on the website, you'll get more information about that. Um, we're building a course to teach people how to do what I do every day. Um, if more information comes about that, you will learn about that. Um, here, here's actually the first time that I'm mentioning this. I'm just thinking about this. This is gonna go in an email. Um, we've been contacted potentially about a TV show, which I think is really exciting. Um, not making a big to-do about it because there's nothing set in stone yet, but it's potentially in the works. We've been contacted by a producer in New York, so that's really exciting. So things like that you might find out on the email list. Um, but if you join, put your email in there, you're gonna get a link in a follow-up email it's going to give you access to the Facebook page and what you'll do is you'll click the link click join I'll add you and there's awesome people in there that are asking questions helping one another I'm in there a lot I'm doing live video um, I'm, I'm showing people things that I'm doing during the day um, so that's something that I think would be very helpful for you if you find this even at all interesting or appealing so number one subscribe because you're here on the page you might as well subscribe to the page number two go to thecarflip.com and put your email address in the little bar up at the top. I'll send you an email, I'll invite you to the Facebook group, and you, you'll be glad you did, because there's people that know um, maybe some things that I don't. I mean, I, I'm, I like to think that I am an expert in car flipping, it's how I pay the bills every single month, but there are people that might know something that I don't, and you have a question and they answer, and they save you the long Google search because they know the solution to your problem. So be sure to join the Facebook group, and otherwise, until the next episode, happy flipping, and I'll see you next time.